All right. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the first CDK Office Hours. My name is Matthew Bonig. Um, you can find me at Matt Bonig on Twitter or over at the cdk.dev Slack channel. Just go to the website and you can find our Slack channel there. <clears throat> um, this is the first of the CDK Office Hours. Uh, right now, my uh, anxiety and nervousness is like right about here. So if I talk really fast or if I breeze over anything, uh, please shout out in the chat and I will do my absolute best to respond as quickly as I can. So I uh, hope you like the mood lighting. I had some music going, but unfortunately a piece of trial software that I had died uh, or ran out of the trial, you know, like two minutes before this starts. So yay for live streaming. Uh, I am an AWS uh, certified DevOps engineer. I also work for a managed service provider out in Charlotte, North Carolina, although I am here in Denver, Colorado. My job is to uh, <clears throat> live, breathe AWS, implement, uh, recommend, and architect various systems for our clients on a daily basis. And that largely means that I'm writing a lot of CDK code. So I want to start these office hours to try to help the community with anything that they may be learning or trying to uh, pick up from the CDK. So to get started, uh, today we're going to hit a, a topic called custom resources. Custom resources are a feature of CloudFormation that allows you to fill in any missing gaps that may not be uh, directly supported by CloudFormation itself. For example, uh, if there is a new product, uh, brand new from AWS, the CloudFormation resource may not exist yet. You may not have the CloudFormation uh, support for it. So you could always use custom resources to get this done. And custom resources are fantastic. They allow you to basically ad hoc any sort of functionality you need into the system while maintaining a lot of uh, very good deterministic type, uh, you know, infrastructure as code type stuff. So today we're going to talk about creating a custom resource. I'll walk you through how to do it with the CDK. We'll try to go ahead and deploy these things out and hopefully if everything goes well, then you'll learn something today about custom resources you may not know before. So let's go ahead and get started. We'll just clear this file out here. Now, uh, right now, I'm going to be using WebStorm for all of my stuff. If you're using VS Code, if you're using some other IDE, uh, then probably uh, similar. Uh, hopefully, I won't hit anything that is too IDE specific here. Uh, but we'll get started here. I have a completely blank directory, and I'm going to go ahead and use Progen to create a new CD applica CDK application. So the way we do that is I've got an alias for Progen called PJ. Let's make it blow this up a little bit, make it a little bit bigger for you. There we go. So we'll say PJ new AWS CDK app, and I do it through TypeScript. So uh, yes, we want to go ahead and install Progen. And we'll see if I came up with that project name, project name right. Uh, looks like it did. So now it's going to go ahead and bootstrap in all of the various functionality, all of the various files and everything to get started. Just takes a moment while fetching packages. If you haven't used Progen before, I highly recommend you check it out. P-R-O-J-E-N. Uh, it is related to the CDK. It is an offshoot project created by members of the CDK team for managing project structures. So whether you're working with a React application, a CDK application, a Vue application, a Python code, whatever it may be, if you're having a code base, then Progen can help you maintain that code base by allowing you to define all the various components of that code base using constructs in the same way that we can use the CDK to define AWS resources using constructs as well. All right, building some fresh packages. Let's see here. Okay, so we got some project structure started up for us. It's still kind of working around along the way, but let's go ahead and review this real quick in case you've never seen a progen project before. So, no, we don't need Git right now. All right, so if you notice here, all the files that started up here are pretty similar to what you'll get from the CDK uh, CLI tool. 
uh, which you may be using previously to initialize your CDK applications. Uh, there's some additional files in here, though, that we'll go ahead and kind of hit. The first and foremost is this progenrc file. So this defines our overall CDK project. In this case, we're using a construct called the AWS CDK TypeScript app project type. Uh, this is a pretty simple off-the-shelf type of CDK project. There are different types of project types we could have used here that we could have bootstrapped. There are CDK construct projects. So if you're going to be building a construct that you want to publish and let others reuse, you'd use that project type instead. Mostly gets set up the same way. Small little differences here and there. Like I recommend you explore that over on the Progen website. Uh, if you want to learn more. But here we go ahead and we define some basic things like what our CDK version is. Uh, you can see here this is using a, a rather old version of the CDK by default, 195.2. We're actually going to go ahead and use a 2.0 during all of this. Um, and I think we're up to RC18 now, if I saw that correctly. Then we've also got things like the name of the project. This will come into play when it comes into your package.json and how some resources are rendered here. But it's this code right here and our handy dandy synth project here that will go ahead and uh, generate out things like our license file, our package.json, a readme file, all of our TS config files and things like that along the way. So. Uh, go ahead, and since I made a change to the CDK version, I'll go ahead and run PJ again. This is going to go ahead and resynthesize this project, and what we're largely going to see here is a change in our package.json. So uh, you can see here I got a typo in my project name. So uh, let's go ahead and do, yeah, rc.18 was what I should have put. Go ahead and fix that back here for the next time we run it. We'll try this again. Now, uh, if you're not familiar, uh, V2 of the CDK is currently in release candidate status. Uh, it is primarily all the same code as what was in V1. There hasn't been any significant changes within the individual modules themselves. The big difference is that in the version two of the CDK, uh, everything now gets shipped as one package. Previously with version one, you had your core library, and then if you were going to be using S3 buckets, you'd have to install the S3 library or the EC2 library or the API gateway library. And all of these things meant having to go back and do another yarn install or NPM install and things like that. And it was a little tedious and there were lots of little problems that came out of this. So in version two of the CDK, which will probably maybe be released by the end of this year. We're not really sure on a, a firm release date yet. Uh, with version two, everything gets packaged as one big library, which means that when you go and do the install, you don't have to keep going back and installing all of your additional modules and things like that. Additionally, uh, anything that is considered an experimental module uh, is not included and you do have to install that separately and that's to try to avoid all the breaking changes that can come with an experimental module. So now that we're installed we got 2.0 and we can see back here in our package.json now uh, we've got our AWS CDK version is 2.0. Uh, this should actually go away here in a moment. I think due to streaming this uh, PC just isn't real fast. Well, here's what we should be seeing right here. AWS CDK dash lib is the new library package name and this is uh, the new v2 version uh, change there on the library name also we now install constructs which is the core dependency for the CDK for the CDKs for the terraform for CDK all those projects and things like that and we're pretty much ready to go uh, the only thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna start taking a look at some of the code that we've got here uh, in a project project everything is in this main.ts file here so the file that's bootstrapped is pretty basic We've got a uh, empty stack that gets created called my stack. We have basic development environment variables that are set up here. And then we create a new instance of that stack just called my stack dev, which is part of our one single application. I'm going to go ahead and simplify a few of these things along the way since we're going to be just talking about constructs today. We'll say my custom resource. And I'm going to go ahead and change this stack name over to uh, let's call this my custom resources example. All right. 
Now, if you notice up here, we've got a bad import on our dependencies, so we're just going to go and fix this up with our AWS CDK lib. Now, the version 2 does not have construct in it anymore. That is going to be part of the constructs library, so we'll go ahead and import that. And now we're back into uh, you know clean code. Everything is showing compilable and all that. Uh, just as a check, I'm going to go ahead and try to synthesize this and make sure that we can at least build the most bootstrapped code without any sort of problems along the way. Hopefully without any problems, this will just render out and it'll be an effectively empty template. Now, uh, the custom resource we're going to build today is a very simple custom resource for uh, populating DynamoDB data into a new table. All right, so we got here, if I go scrolling back here, we can see we got just a, a basic empty template here, nothing fancy. Again, we can go over into our uh, CDK out directory, and we can see here we've got all of our normal sort of minor assets and things, and a basic template that really doesn't have a whole lot going on it, on in it. All right, so let's go ahead and start building something. Uh, the first thing I want to do is we've got to have a DynamoDB table to do this with. So I'll say new table, and we'll call this my table. And for our properties, we do have to define a couple of things. First thing is we've got to make sure we have our import. Now, again, if you notice here, I didn't have to go back and install any additional dependencies. This is all just part of the CDK lib is the DynamoDB table, which is super nice. Now I'll go through here and my required property, a partition key. I'll go ahead and fill this in. Uh, I typically follow along with just, uh, just calling primary keys or partition keys a, pay, a P key. No reason to get too fancy with it, especially in this case. And we'll go ahead and say it's a string type. And that's it. Uh, you know, of course, the beauty of L2 constructs, you don't have to uh, supply too much to them. And we have our table. Now I'm gonna need this table here in a moment, so I'll go ahead and save a reference to it. And then we're gonna go ahead and we've got this table now. We wanna put some sample data into it. We wanna put some um, something to start off with. These are often uh, using fixtures along the way. I'm gonna create a fixture construct here. So we'll say new table fixture. And again, uh, fixture data, call that. Now for the properties of this, I'm gonna to have to give it a table. So I'll give it a table name. And then I'll probably also want to give it a set of records to use. And in this case, I'm going to give it a record where PK equals something and value is just whatever. Really dumb, simple record. Obviously, this would be a lot more complex if we were dealing with a more complex table. Um, but in this case, this is just demo code, so we're going to keep it with this at this point. Well, let's read some comments. One of the reasons why I personally can't move to v2 yet is because a bunch of experimental stuff is missing and most of my CDK solutions heavily rely on those experimental features. Yes, absolutely. v2 is not ready for, for prime time yet. Uh, it is very much in a testing uh, phase. It is RC. However, uh, if you are using non-experimental features, I would say it's probably good or okay to start moving to. Um, but for now, uh, yeah, hold off until everything is ready. And there are ways that you can bring in those experimental uh, modules and things, but we'll talk about that during another CDK office hours. Maybe I'll have one all about nothing but V2. And also uh, TDD with CDK, yes. Uh, I love TDD. Uh, for the CDK, I'm very hit or miss on it. A lot of the times what I'm dealing with when I'm writing CDK code is still trying to figure out what the architecture is that I necessarily need in which case I can't really write the test for something that I don't know exactly what I need yet. And usually it's a lot easier to retrofit tests in after the fact. And we're gonna actually do this here at the end and I'll show you how you can do that. So that you can still have tests, uh, you just don't have to do them up front. Uh, TDD is a good approach, test-driven development is great. Um, I have used it on a few cases before, but in this situation we're gonna skip it because I feel it's a little unnecessary in this case. So, uh, of course, I don't actually have a table fixture yet, so I'm going to go ahead and create our class. So we'll say scope is a construct, and now this is pretty standard 
Uh, nothing too fancy here. Uh, construct development. If you haven't done it before, all I'm doing is going ahead and creating a new class called table fixture. I'm going to give a table fixture props as the properties into this thing. Uh, and then just fill out the rest of this and extend the construct. And we're going to go ahead and also create this interface along the way. And finally, we need to go ahead and call our super class. And <clears throat> no more red errors. Everything is generally good. So let's talk a little bit first about what this construct is going to do. Uh, this construct is going to create a custom resource. That custom resource is going to represent the state or the data that we want in our DynamoDB table. Additionally, it is going to uh, create a Lambda function. That Lambda function is going to be responsible for loading that data into the DynamoDB table. So let's start off with that. We'll go ahead and create a new, I like doing everything in Node, so let's go ahead and use a Node.js function here. This will definitely simplify a few things for us. We'll go ahead and say, this is my fixture handler. And in here, we're going to go ahead and fill in just the basic stuff that we need. We don't have to worry about any VPC connectivity because this is all dealing with uh, DynamoDB table. Uh, I'm not going to worry about changing any of the bundling or anything else. Really, the only thing I'm going to do at this point is set up the environment variables that will be handed to this. And specifically, I'm going to go ahead and give it the table name that it wants to interface with. And that comes directly off of our table. Now, if you notice here, I don't actually have a table property yet, so let's go ahead and add that in. And we'll call that an I table. Uh, whether you use uh, the direct concrete classes table or I table, uh, in the case of the CDK, it's probably a little bit more personal preference. If you're following true OOP, then you're probably going to be wanting using the interfaces. But the fact is, if you used the concrete classes, in this case, like just table, you probably wouldn't really see much of a difference one way or another. All right, so we got our Node.js function here. I'll go ahead and save that reference off as well. We'll call this our handler. And the other thing I need to do real quick is I need to actually create a uh, the actual handler code, the actual Node.js code for this thing. Um, to do that, uh, the Node.js function expects that to be in a, a specific file. I can actually never remember what that file name is that it looks for. It's a combination of the construct name or the ID and some other things like that. I'm going to leave this blank right now. Try to sync this. It's going to purposely fail. And when it fails, it's going to tell me the file that it was looking for that it couldn't find. And I'm going to use that as just sort of a cheat here to save myself the time of looking up in the documentation on how to do this. All right, so here we go. I tried to synth this and it couldn't because if we keep scrolling up, uh, where's my error here? Looks like we got a couple errors I'm going to have to deal with. Well, yep, I'm going to have to deal with them until we can get this squared away. So um, we got table, we got records. Let's clear these things up real quick. Records is going to be in any. Don't really care what's getting handed in there. And that hopefully will resolve those so that I can sync again. By the way, while that's running, uh, one thing that I often have open and working with is the CDK documentation. Uh, this API reference, it's a pinned tab in my browser. I'm always hopping back and forth with this. And I'm often going into the overview sections of each of the individual modules, because that's where I'm really going to see a lot of really good examples here. So this is an example of how to use the custom resource. It shows me a great full on example of how to use, set the resource type, set properties on it, set the service token, all that sort of stuff along the way. Uh, very handy to come back to this. We'll dig into this a little bit more here in just a moment. All right. So our synth failed again. Yeah, it's having a problem because our TS, our handler thing isn't being used. All right, well, let's go back to the documentation then. So if I go back and I look at my Lambda, Node.js, 
then over here it'll tell me exactly what file name it's supposed to be looking for so it's going to look for a here we go cool construct super package you know what let's make this even easier let's just tell it which one we're going to look for so entry is path.join our current directory and we'll say fixture handler dot ts all right easy enough let's get our path resolved and let's go ahead and add in oh it'd help if i was back on the other sorry about that gonna have to be better about that um okay so we're just gonna directly point it to an entry file i'll just call it our fixture handler.ts now need to export our handler and i'm gonna just fill in a really simple isn't really doing a whole lot here We'll say this is just going to console.log our event. Generally end up always putting these things at the beginning of my handlers. It's always good to know what you're dealing with here. There are too many cases where you end up wanting this later. So let's just go ahead and put it in now. All right. So we have our handler. So at this point, um, we've got our Lambda function. Really not going to do a whole lot at this point. Uh, let's go ahead and also save ourselves a little bit more problem here. Table name equals our process dot env dot table name. And let's go ahead and output that as well. All right. Now, we've got our Lambda. That's all basically okay. Again, I'm going to go ahead and just try to synth this while we continue to work. Now that we have our handler, we need to create our custom resource. So we'll go custom resource, we'll create this, and we're going to call this our fixture CR, for lack of a better name. And here, go ahead and let it do our import. All right, so we need to provide a service token. Now, in the case of dealing with a Lambda function as the back end for the custom resource, we need to provide it the ARN for the function. Easy enough, we'll just say our handler.function ARN. As our properties, we're gonna go ahead and give it two. Uh, actually, we're just gonna give it the records. So we'll say the records we wanna deal with is our props.records. Now, one thing to keep in mind about this is uh, when we're dealing with this fixture, uh, these records we're dealing with are probably going to be uh, fairly small in size. Uh, not going to be dealing with potentially many, many kilobytes of records uh, to put it out there. Um, but there is a limit to how big a custom resource can be. So if you were going to be trying to do this fixture with a whole lot of data, then you would want to do this through a different mechanism, most likely taking that fixture data, putting it into an S3 bucket, and then having the Lambda function read that data out of the S3 bucket and apply it that way versus taking it in as properties on the handler. But this will do just fine for now. So we'll go ahead and do this. Let's see, our synth did fail. Let's see if we can find out why. Uh, again, it's because we weren't using our handler. Well, that should be fine now. So we'll go ahead and synth again. Now, if I was to go ahead and try to deploy this code into an AWS environment, it would fail. And it would fail very, very painfully because custom resources are not a synchronous mechan uh, mechanism. If I go back and we take a look here again at the documentation for custom resources, we'll go back down over here to core. Let's go back to custom resource. 
Uh, custom resources will be implemented. Uh, in this case, they say by a Lambda, but technically there are other things you can do. Uh, let's go back to the overview code here. Back to our CRs. So we give it a service token, a Lambda function, uh, R and to use, and it's expected that that Lambda function is going to make a, a HTTP call back over to AWS to the CloudFormation API to register that the custom resource has either succeeded or it has failed. It is not a synchronous mechanism. If you work with the Lambdas with API Gateway, that's a synchronous function call. API Gateway will execute the Lambda function and the Lambda function is expected to return a status. Uh, when the function is done running and it returns that status, API Gateway responds and does its thing. Not the case with custom resources. With a custom resource, uh, we do need to go ahead and uh, register that callback. It's not as simple as just returning. So we're going to have to do some fancy work here within our fixture handler. Now, uh, everything that gets passed in on this event is going to tell us everything we need to know about responding to that CR. Now, um, if we go and we take a look here, uh, in the CDK documentation, it unfortunately doesn't really give you the information needed to uh, respond to this accordingly. If you're working with, uh, if you've worked with CloudFormation and custom resources before, you'll know that uh, there are some ways that you get a uh, some automatic nice handling with custom resources through a CFN response module. We don't get that though, so we're going to go find it. So we're gonna go type in CFN response. And we're gonna go find this uh, reference implementation for a CloudFormation response module. It allows us to go ahead and respond back to CloudFormation with the success or failure of this. And if I keep going down a little bit, you can see here, uh, if I was doing these things within CloudFormation more directly or within Python, this would actually kind of come for free, but we don't. So we've got our module source code here. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this, go back over to our code here. I'm gonna add in a new file. We'll say CFN response.ts. Now, a uh, few things to know right away. This code doesn't work great with asynchronous calls. We're gonna modify this along the way. In fact, I'm gonna make this all really nice and happy with uh, TypeScript and with async calls and things like that. This was written sort of before the day where Node.js and all of that got super useful. In fact, I think I've got some code already, so bear with me for a moment. Uh, mostly the thing here is if you notice, we've got stuff like, uh, you know, we're doing context.done here on these responses. That's not something that I particularly like to keep doing when we're talking about um, nice asynchronous JavaScript code. So bear with me, I've got another project and another bucket somewhere else. Just gotta find it. All right, this looks better. Let's go ahead and use this. While I'm doing this, any questions so far, anything that you'd like me to go into a little bit more detail about or that I've breezed by a little too quickly? Yeah, video's a little choppy. So I've been noticing that, um, unfortunately, I think trying to stream, record, and do all of this on a MacBook was a little bit of a bad idea. Uh, so in the future, I'm gonna try to see if I can find a better setup to, to handle all this. Uh, yes, that was Docker running in the background. So the Node.js function that I'm using uh, over here, this guy right here, it is going to go ahead and handle bundling concerns. Uh, so like if I had 
uh, package dependencies or other things with this code if I was going to be using, say, like Axios to be making HTTP calls. Uh, this Node.js function can handle bundling that all up into a nice little resource for me, and it does that by default using a Docker container. If I didn't have Docker in my environment, I could actually go ahead and use uh, ESBuild to do this. I would just need to make sure that I had ESBuild installed in my path. All right, so through the magic of copy and paste, I'm going to put a new version of our CFN response over here. Fundamentally, not a whole lot different. Uh, the big thing is just properly introducing some types and some things like that along the way. Makes this all a little bit easier to deal with. So first thing I'm gonna do here is let's go ahead and import it. All right, and now let's go ahead and we'll just say that we're going to send our response back. Uh, now, if uh, let's go take a look at this guy real quick. There are these values that I need to hand over as the event, as well as a response status and some response data along the way. These are pretty much the fields that come directly off of the event. So I can pass them over pretty much as is. Uh, so a question from the chat, what is a fixture? A fixture is a very simple utility that I can use to apply data against a database. Uh, it's meant to go fix some sort of data in a database, but largely they're used for doing things like pre-populating lookup tables with, you know, like all of your state and, uh, you know, province codes and things like that into a freshly created database. All right, so we'll go ahead and do this. Now, one thing here is if I take a look at this event, uh, there is the physical resource ID. I need to go ahead and I'm gonna pull that off the context, which I actually don't have yet. Now, if you notice here, I'm being really lazy. On my event and my context, I'm just using any as the type. Uh, I could import in some uh, Lambda types so that there's a little bit of better visibility into this. Uh, let's actually do that real quick. And I can never remember what the import call is. So let's see here. NPM import AWS Lambda event types. I should remember this, but I do not. I think this is the guy. Let's give it a try and see what happens. Now, because this is a progen project. I'm not going to do that uh, npm install myself. Instead, I'm going to go in here into depths and I'm going to add it as a dependency into progen. And I'll go ahead and redo my pj. Uh, so similar to the same term when talking about unit tests and whatnot. Um, not sure how it relates to unit tests there. Um, fixtures are mostly a way of just uh, loading data into a database. Uh, unit tests are usually meant for mocking a lot of data and other things. And so a little bit of a difference there. Uh, what's the difference uh, than using the custom resource module versus the provider framework? Glad you asked. We are gonna talk about custom resource providers here after we hit these types of things. Uh, I wanna make sure that we kinda hit the rudimentary stuff, the sort of the core of it, and then we'll talk about how providers and things can actually make all of this a whole lot easier along the way. So now that we have that in, let's see if we have any uh, custom resource. Here we go. So now we got a custom resource uh, event. Uh, that should be good, and that'll help us out a little bit. And this happens to be, I just know it's a log stream name, but let's see if we can find, if there's a type for context. Mm, CloudFormation event context. Oh, that should work. Now this is interesting. We're gonna have to explore this a little bit more. Custom CloudFormation event context coming out of the CDK lib. Wasn't expecting that. Uh, that may work for us, that may not. Let's take a look and see what 
is actually off that object now. Yeah, it's not really getting us what I was expecting. All right. Well, I happen to know from experience that what we're looking for is the log stream name. So we're going to do that for now. And we'll come back and revisit this here in a little bit. And bear with me while I double check one thing real quick. Yep. But we just want the physical ID, the physical resource name to be the log stream name off of our context. And switch that back, clear that out. All right. For our uh, success or failure, we'll just go ahead and say success for now. And we'll pass an empty object for the body. All right. So we got this guy. Let's go ahead and let's give this a shot to see first if we can synth it. And if we can synth it, then we're going to actually try to do a deploy out to an environment and we'll see what happens. Uh, if everything works great, then we'll get a successful deploy. But if there was something wrong with a custom resource, it'll fail. And rather than wait for the long and painful rollback, I'll just change our stack names along the way. Ah, DB fixtures come from the Rails world. Yeah, I've seen them mostly in Django um, and some other systems, but it would not surprise me if Rails was the originator of them. Yeah, the, the autocomplete IntelliSense, I will try to be much better about that next time around so we can see a little bit more for how to really get uh, the development side of this working. There's going to be, I think, a... Uh, general, you know, another office hours about specifically when you're doing the development of Lambda functions and all the ways that you can leverage your uh, IDE to help you along the way through IntelliSense and other sorts of stuff. Uh, I need to get a lot better VS Code before I do that, though, because I think most people are probably running VS Code instead of WebStorm. Uh, the other thing is that this is going to definitely be a topic within the CDK book. So if you haven't heard yet, the cdkbook.com uh, there are four of us, uh, Matt Coulter, uh, Thorsten, Thos, uh, Sathya, uh, who is here in the stream with us, I believe, today, and me are writing a book about the CDK. If you are interested, uh, you know, things like how to use your IDE, how to do testing, all that will be covered in the book. Go to the cdkbook.com and check it out. All right, so we got a synth. We're going to be real daring here. And the for first thing is I need to set up my AWS profile to go to my personal account. We definitely don't need this going anywhere else for now. And then we're going to go ahead and do a CDK deploy. And let's go ahead and make this window a little bit larger we can, so we can see everything that's about to happen here. I really do need to find a better shortcut key for this. Ah, uh, yes, IntelliJ WebStorm. I've been using uh, these IntelliJ's products since probably about 08 when they were doing ReSharper uh, for Visual Studio and they made Visual Studio actually usable. Uh, thanks for the plug, Satya. Yes, the cdkbook.com. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I don't think I could go back. I tried VS Code a couple of times in the past and unfortunately, WebStorm, their refactoring tools are just way too good. They're IntelliSense. Uh, even when you don't have a strongly typed language like TypeScript, if you're dealing with JavaScript, they can still figure out a lot for you and help you along the way. And it's just too valuable for me to give up. So uh, we're doing our deploy. We can see here that there's going to be some IAM stuff because we're dealing with the Lambda function here. This all looks good. So we'll go ahead and do the deploy. Now, if we're super lucky and I haven't screwed up any of my code, which is probably not likely what should be happening at this point is we'll we'll create the stack it'll go out there it'll create the lambda function all the necessary features for that lambda function and then it will go ahead and uh, try to call that lambda function itself now we're already 
pushing up on the original runtime of about an hour, so we may have to cut this a little bit short and I'll have to do a lot of hand waving here for what's going to happen next. Uh, but primarily here, uh, what we'd see is, and while this is going, let's go ahead and go back and talk about what that would be. Right now, uh, our handler code doesn't do anything. Uh, all it does is output some stuff to a console and then tell CloudFormation that everything quote unquote worked correctly. What we would really need to do at this point is start making some Dynamo DB calls. Now, we can go ahead and write that code. We can import the AWS SDK into it and things like that. Uh, but when we go to make that actual call, we would hit a failure right away because this handler doesn't have permission to access the table. So let's go ahead and fix that. We'll say props.table. Grant, uh, we'll say write data, probably doesn't have a need to read it. We'll say that that uh, handler function has the ability to write data to the table, and we'll let it go ahead and do its thing. So we fill out the rest of this handler code. Uh, I think we're going to end up doing next week probably a CDK Office Hours Part 2, so we can talk about the rest of this and really fill out this code more. But at this point, the code will go write the stuff to DynamoDB, and assuming that there weren't any errors with it, again, return a successful message back to CloudFormation. Right now, we've got it going out there and trying to create this custom resource. It's taken a little while. My guess is that there was an error there. So I'll have to take a look, see what that error is. Uh, let's go back into... Let's go back over this documentation for now. We'll, we'll chat it here. We'll kind of chat about the stuff here. Uh, do you typically keep a CDK project in the same repo as the application it's for? Fantastic question. So, uh, yes, I usually do. It, it kind of depends a little bit from project to project, but in general, I'll probably start there where the CDK code is very close to the application code. And the reason for that is that a lot of times I'm dealing with serverless-based applications. And with AWS serverless-based applications, you're often dealing with these things like Lambda functions, API Gateway, DynamoDB, IAM policies, SNS, SQS. All of these components that used to reside within the application are still sort of application infrastructure. So having them close to the application code typically makes a lot of sense. Uh, however, some reasons why you may not want to. Well, if you're going to be making a lot of changes to your application code and you've set up a CI CD pipeline for your CDK code, well, if those things are very dis uh, disparate from each other, for example, um, you, let's say you've got a pipeline for a Docker container to go out to an EKS cluster. Uh, you know, that code's going to change very often. You're going to have a pipeline that's going to kick off and build that Docker container, upload it uh, to an ECR repository, and then push it out to an EKS cluster. Your CDK code isn't going to be really changing at the same pace. And if you were to then try to set up a pipeline over your CDK code, that pipeline would naturally try to kick off every time you made a change to your Docker container. And you'd have to start going in, putting all these sort of checks and balances to make sure that that wasn't happening. It's not a great solution. So in those cases, I'd keep those two things separate. But if I'm dealing with an AWS serverless application where I've got Lambdas and SNS and SQS and those things where they are very, very tightly coupled in a lot of ways, then they'll typically be within the same repo. All right, so this thing is definitely taking longer than a few seconds to run. And uh, so my bet is that I need to go take a look in some areas. And I think that's actually going to be a great topic to talk about for two. So um, I want to continue on because there is one thing I want to talk about before we wrap this up with about five to ten minutes left. And that is the uh, custom resource module within the CDK itself. So if I go take a look here, there is specifically a custom resources module here. And the purpose of this module is to take everything that we just did there as far as creating a Lambda function, create a custom resource to do what is basically an API call and simplify that process down. A very handy little module here. So we sit in there and we define this provider and a provider is going to let us define things like what's going to happen when 
<clears throat> um, uh, an event happens within the custom resource or the provider and uh, what's going to happen when the whole thing is completed? What are our log retention policies for all of this? What is the role that we're going to use? So we define this provider and it more or less takes uh, place of the Lambda function. It acts as a layer between the custom resource and the Lambda function that gives you a lot more flexibility and a lot more functionality in the long term. It also handles things like being able to ha handle asynchronous stuff a little bit easier and a little bit nicer along the way. Uh, you define these things out. In this case, here's some Python code that shows you how do you respond to various events coming from the custom resource. And then if it's a, something like an on create, or you're creating the resource, go do these things. If you're deleting, go do these things and that sort of stuff. Helps you really lay out your code and separate it out a little bit nicer. If you're going to go down the route of doing custom resources, I highly recommend you take a look at using these guys to do it. The other guy, the other uh, construct in here that's also very useful is the custom resource for AWS API. So let's say we go back to kind of an earlier example where a brand new feature has come out for AWS and the CloudFormation project or CloudFormation does not support that particular thing yet. So you can't use CloudFormation to create some new resource in AWS. Uh, but the API does exist. Well, what you can do is you can come in here and create this AWS custom resource, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, construct. And when you do that, what you do is you define things like what service, what API is gonna be hit, the action to can take against that resource, or against that service, and then how to generate the physical resource ID for this new custom resource. So if we wanted to do things like make an API gateway change, we would say the service is API gateway, the change is a put or a post or whatever. All of these things are basic AWS API calls, nothing fancy. Think of this very similar to the way that you can do an API gateway that is integrated directly to AWS resources without a Lambda function in between, where you have API gateway directly called AWS API. Same thing here. This is a construct that allows you to define the API that you want to hit with some basic information. And this custom resource is going to go and handle all that Lambda work for you to make it much easier to spin up and, and really maintain these things long term. You don't have to worry now about, oh, did I respond to the custom resource through the CloudFormation API the correct way? And that's really, really useful because as we've seen here, even though I was basically copying and pasting code and doing things fairly straightforward, this is failing right now. And this is failing because it didn't make that response back to CloudFormation saying that the resource was created correctly. Somewhere in this Lambda function here, I've got an error. Now I have to go dig through CloudWatch logs to try to find those, but more importantly, and this is where the real pain is, this resource will not automatically fail or will not fail for another hour or so. Once the timeout occurs within CloudFormation to say, oh, this custom resource didn't get created with an hour, it's going to try to do a rollback of the entire stack. And when it does a rollback of the stack, it's going to go to this custom resource and it's going to say, please delete yourself. And very likely this same error will occur again, not responding the success of that delete back to CloudFormation. And it's got to wait another hour for that to occur. So now, because of one little bug in writing this custom resource, I'm going to have to wait two hours before this stack can be torn down, deleted, and I can go try this again. Now I could come back here and sort of cheat a little bit. I, I come down here to my stack name and I change this name right here. I, I kill my process and, and then I go ahead and I try to redeploy the stack. But now you got these weird orphan stacks everywhere and it's, it's a big pain in the butt. So this is why I highly recommend, while you still can do some raw custom resource work with Lambdas and it is very good to know the basic functionality of how it works, try to use these other constructs like the AWS custom resource and the provider and these other things that make dealing with, the, with cloud formation much, much easier along the way. It'll save yourself a lot of time and a lot of problems. All right, so we're getting pretty close. Um, it would probably take me a good five or 10 minutes just to get to the point where I'm taking a look at these logs because this system isn't really set up great. Again, 
first time on doing these office hours. Uh, hopefully, you know, learning experience for everybody along the way, especially for me. Um, if you have any questions, please send them over in chat right now. What I'd ask for is if you do have any comments or any feedback, uh, please hit me up on Twitter. My DMs are always open. Again, it is uh, at Matt Bonig on Twitter. I'm going to go ahead and grab another. Put this up here. All right. Hit me up at, at Matt Bonig on Twitter. DMs are open. Let me know if there is anything in here that you'd recommend I change for the next office hours. If there are any topics that you'd like me to cover, absolutely hit me up uh, and let me know. Otherwise, please join us over on the cdk.dev Slack channel. Um, I'm always trying to be active over there, helping out wherever we can in the community, get people familiar with the CDK. And um, yeah, let me know how it goes. So uh, reasons for, prefer, prefer, for preferring TypeScript for the CDK. Um, yes, two primarily. Um, for the last about year or so, I've been running a community survey for the CDK. And as far as language types go, the only two that people ever respond with are either TypeScript or Python. No knock against Python, I think it's a good language, but I don't spend nearly enough time in it to be proficient in coding with it. So uh, that's the number one reason why I go for TypeScript is because I just spend more time in it. I'm usually you know, having to look up less in terms of API docs and things like that. Uh, the second reason is because it is sort of the first class citizen within the CDK community. If you're going through and you're looking at documentations, blogs, anything, Generally, the community has gravitated more towards TypeScript, so you're more likely to find examples, blog posts, help, and things like that if you're doing it in TypeScript code. I know that's not a great answer. Uh, I know that the CDK team, as well as the community in general, is trying to be better about really treating Python as a first-class language. Now, as far as the other ones go, .NET, uh, Java, uh, I'm sure that there are people out there using Java as a language. I've never seen it before. Uh, I've seen a couple of blog articles about .NET, but it's pretty rare. Uh, certainly never seen anyone using F Sharp for it. Go is getting very, very popular. I think we're going to see much more around Go over the course of the next year, uh, especially as Go is becoming much more of a uh, preferred language for Lambda functions because of the performance that you can get out of it. So. Uh, that's why I go for TypeScript. Uh, that's why I kind of tend to lean towards it. I will probably continue doing these things uh, in TypeScript because I think it's a fairly readable language and the uh, type safety support within, especially IntelliJ here and other editors, is very, very good. Um, yeah, TypeScript examples will be more available on the internet. Uh, Progen to create a CDK Python app. You're right. I don't believe there is a Progen project type right now or Python. However, there's no reason why there couldn't be. I think it's just a case of it having not been developed yet. If you're a Python developer, if you like uh, the Progen, I highly recommend trying to contribute to it. I know that they are always open and love PRs and things like that. Uh, I've never seen a .NET CDK project. I saw one during a blog post. They are kind of rare. Um, also because a lot said so. Well, a lot is sort of the foremost voice on uh, the CDK, and I couldn't speak to why he likes TypeScript, but I'm, I'm very waffly on TypeScript. Uh, having done JavaScript development for many, many years, I feel like TypeScript is an overly verbose language that really just gets in the way more times than it solves problems for me. However, I can't knock it for all of the extremely valuable type safety and IntelliSense and IDE functionality and linting and all the benefits that type, uh, type, safe, type safe languages give you along the way. All right, uh, well, that's it for now. Uh, thank you again for joining today. If you liked this, please let me know on Twitter or over on the Slack channel if you have any recommendations for future videos 
uh, or future topics to discuss, let me know. Um, I will probably try to do one of these next week, although it might be in two weeks in which we will round out this custom resource discussion. I will show you specifically the errors that were happening here within this custom resource, how to resolve them, and then we'll go through and show an example of how to actually implement the fixture as well as how to use these other custom resource uh, constructs like the AWS custom resource policy or the providers to sort of solve these problems in the future. Uh, but that's it for today. Thank you very much for joining me on this first one and uh, have a great day.